Let's do it. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the father of biohacking himself, Dave Asprey. Now, for some reason, if you don't know who this genius is, you're about to get to know him. He is the founder and chairman of Bulletproof, and he is also a three-time New York Times bestselling author. I assume with his new book coming out, he's going to make it a fourth. <laughs> the odds are high, but you know, you never know until the New York Times publishes, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, we'll go fingers crossed and I have ample faith that you'll actually get there. You are a science author as well, for those people that don't know, host of the Webby award-winning podcast, Bulletproof Radio, which I absolutely love. Highly encourage you guys to check it out. And has been featured on the Today Show, CNN, the New York Times, Dr. Oz, and many, many more. You've been doing it for over two decades now, which is absolutely incredible. Dave, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. Jay, thanks for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Honestly, I'm, I'm really, really happy to have you here. Uh, if you can tell by the smile on my face, people that are listening don't can't see it, <laughs> but I'm smiling and laughing. Um, I'm really looking forward to actually diving in and unboxing uh, your story and everything that you do. Uh, before we do that, though, I have one question I love asking all my guests at the very start. I, I think my audience is getting sick and tired of me asking it, but I'm going to do it anyway. What does success look like to you? Uh, I would measure success in, am I happy the vast majority of the time? And do I have more energy than I need all the time? When was the moment for you that you realized that that was success for you? Has it been this gradual thing over time or was there a catalyst moment somewhere? It was about like 15 seconds ago and you asked me what success was. I just made it up and it, and it made me feel really good and it filled me with energy. So I decided that was actually what it was. It was it no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's come to me over time. And I, I have a very weird path. When I was, oh, 22, 23, I sold the first thing ever sold over the internet. And this was before there was a word for e-commerce. And I had this brief period, my fat picture was in Entrepreneur Magazine. And like, hey, everybody, this kid, he's selling t-shirts over this thing called the interwebs or something. And like, actually the web didn't exist then either. So it was the internet. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm famous. I've been in like 80 magazines as this, you know, as this young guy. And I wasn't any happier. I was like, oh, that sucked. I was thought if everyone you know, heard about you, you would be happy. So it didn't work. And you fast forward a bit, 26, I make $6 million. And I'm a co-founder of the part of the company that held Google's first servers when it was two guys and two computers. And when I had $6 million, I looked at another friend of this company where we all made more money than we should have. And I said, you know, I'll be happy to make $10 million. So I'm like, well, crap. Okay, so money doesn't make you happy. Fame doesn't make you happy. It's got to be something else. Meanwhile, I weigh 300 pounds. I don't have enough energy. I'm brain fog all the time. I have all the diseases of aging before I'm 30. Like maybe that's what it is. So it comes down to happiness is an inner state and it's really a lot easier to do it when you have enough energy. And that's why biohacking is really about teaching your body by manipulating your environment to make more energy than you need, which gives you enough energy to do the work it takes to be happy regardless of what's happening in the world around you. Mm. There's quite a few questions that I have just coming out of that response. The first one that I do want to ask you about is you were overweight for quite some time. How did that all start? Like, why were you overweight in the first place? Um, I was overweight uh, because I was a bad person and I would just stuff my face with potato chips and it was really just guilt and shame. Okay. Not really. Uh, <laughs> I'm allowed to fat shame myself. Okay. No. And, and that was actually a story that was kind of in my head uh, without all the potato chips necessarily. But um, I, I literally thought it was a willpower issue. Right. But the reality is that I lived in a basement that had toxic mold when I was a kid. It was a nice house. We didn't know that there was mold. Mold is a potent external estrogen. So I'm sitting there, my body's trying to do all the puberty stuff and I'm growing stretch marks and I'm getting fat and my metabolism is breaking in part because of environmental toxins. Plus I was eating all the healthy stuff, low, low fat. When you eat fat, squeeze margarine is supposed to be good for you. So I was poisoning myself every which way and didn't know it. So my metabolism did a terrible job of taking air and food to combine them to make energy. When you do a terrible job of doing that, you take air and food and you make inflammation instead. So I was inflamed. I was fat. I was pre-diabetic. I had arthritis since I was 14, um, cognitive problems before I was 30, high risk of stroke and heart attack in labs when I was 27, 
uh, and uh, some other bad risk factor things. Oh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. So, okay, I'm 48. I have the brain response time of a 20 year old. I have the arterial flexibility of a 24 year old. And if I can go from the total shit show that I was, hope I could say that on your podcast, to where I am now, okay, I'm the worst case you could have. So if I can do this, it's gonna be easier for you. <laughs> and that's why I write my books. That's why I created this biohacking field because I want no one to go through what I went through. And I'm just, I'm, I'm a tough case. So I'm just like the example of possibility and I promise you, if you're listening to this, you're not as screwed up as I was. So it's doable. And I, I'm happy to, you know, light the way, especially because no one did that for me. The knowledge, it, most of it did exist even a long time ago. Not everything we know now, but it was so unevenly distributed. And there's a focused effort to tell smart people that the stuff that works doesn't work because it turns out you make more money selling people stuff that makes them fat while telling them that it makes them thin because they'll keep buying it forever. If you sell someone something, you take this one pill, you never be fat again, you're only going to sell one pill. And well, <laughs> that's kind of the world we live in. I guess the obvious answer would be how in the world you did it. But I guess what I want to ask you is, is go back to the moment when you realized this all needed to change. What was that moment like for you? What ended up happening? And then what sort of led you on the, the path of changing? Well, fat people are willpower athletes. And we all know, okay, this is 42% of Americans. I don't know what it is down under, but it's, you know, it's a meaningful number. And we all know we're fat because we have mirrors. You don't even need a scale. And we have pants. You know, like, there's my fat pants and there's my, I hope I can wear those someday again pants and, and all those sorts of things. And I, I don't do that anyway. You don't, I don't need fat pants because I'm, I'm constant. And you, you go through and, and you say, okay, I know it's a problem. And today I'm not going to eat the cookie. And then you eventually eat half the cookie and then you're like, God, what's wrong with me? Right. And what's going on is willpower is a biological resource based on electrons. And your body is like, oh, you're not going to give me the cookie? Let me just turn down the energy until you eat the cookie. And as we turn down the energy, the cookie gets louder and louder and louder. So that's always been an issue. I Even as a teenager, I'm like, man, I, I don't want to have these three ripples here. Like, I don't want to lose weight. I'm going to run. Newsflash, exercise doesn't make you thin. It never did. Food makes you thin. Exercise gives you a little bit of extra muscle. <laughs> you can't exercise away the pizza. It doesn't work like that. But I believed it did, right? So it got to the point where, okay, I've you know made this money. I lost that $6 million when I was 28, which was kind of a traumatic experience. And I'm like, okay, I've been in bad relationships uh, and I don't know why I stay in them. I don't know why I eat the cookie when I say I'm not going to eat it. Like, I, I don't actually know why I should be happy based on doing all the things that are supposed to make you happy. I have career achievement. You know, I've done all these things. I have a BMW uh, and I'm still miserable. So I decided to do the work on that. And, and that's probably when. And along the way, the doctor looked at me and said, stop taking vitamin C. It could kill you. I'm like, wait a minute. This doctor's incompetent. And I fired him. And I just said, I'm gonna have to hack myself the way I'm teaching engineers to build the internet. Like I'm, I'm you know, ground zero of what it's became cloud computing and, and just this amazing time of innovation and just like creative stuff all around me. But I'm tired and the accelerator's all the way to the floor and I'm pushing harder, but you can't push anymore and you're slowing down. And, and it's it's a sense of of like fear that comes from that. So I just said, all right, if the doctors can't do it, I'm tired of feeling like crap all the time. I'm going to have to hack this. And I started, I'd come home from work and I would just start reading biological textbooks and studies and just zooming in on this. And then I'd end the night, all right, I'm going to order whatever that supplement is, whatever that technology is. I'm just every, it's the most important thing in my life. I'm going to do it. And I tried exercise. I did an hour and a half a day of exercise, six days a week for 18 months. And at the end of that, I still had a 46 inch waist. I still weighed 300 pounds. I was strong, but I was still fat. And like the sense of failure and just like, ah, oh, like what do I have to do? This is what's holding people back because the instruction manual wasn't printed when I was born. Um, it wasn't for any of us. My work has been, I'm just going to assume that other people are as lazy as me, which means we don't want to do more than is necessary. We're not willing to suffer every day for the rest of our life to look a little bit better, feel a little bit better. So how do I do it in a way that makes me feel good all the time so I'm not wasting my effort on just management? And it turns out it's possible. And I've learned from people three times my age and some of the luminaries in the field. And I've done a lot of experimenting and I've come up with some new concepts. And you know what? 
it's not hard. And that's why I wrote Fast This Way, my newest book. Like, what's the highest return on investment behavior you can have? Let's think about this. Skipping breakfast. You don't spend energy making breakfast. You don't spend time making breakfast. You don't spend money on breakfast. And you got more energy back that day because you actually felt better and you got younger over time. So you invested less than nothing because you didn't have to do anything for breakfast and you got a return right now and a long-term return. And it makes it one of the cheapest, simplest and best ways to feel better now, have more energy, live longer and maybe have pants that fit better. But if you do it the wrong way, I'm concerned people can do the same thing with fasting that they that they've done with the keto diet. And my first big book on the Bulletproof diet, it had intermittent fasting, it has keto and, and things like that in it, but it's a cycling in and out of them. And what happened over the course of 10 years, kind of the bastardization and like, oh, keto bro, don't eat a carb again or you're a bad person. The problem is that breaks people. It, it broke me when I was experimenting on this diet stuff. So you wanna be able to do fasting the right way, not too much, not too little and make it work for your biology. And it's different for women and men, but it's not very hard. And that's why like, this is worth a book because otherwise here's their book on fasting. Step one, don't eat for a while. Step two is good for you. Boom, wrote a book, but it's harder than that. But it's also something you can do without willpower and without pain and struggling. And that's what I want to teach people. Which is honestly absolutely amazing. And, and I want to get to the fastest way book in a moment and dissect that. One question I did have, which you mentioned, you losing six million dollars. Now that's no small amount of money. Yeah, that was nineteen ninety dollars. That's like eighteen million dollars in twenty twenty money too. Yeah, which is still a lot of money. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you share that traumatic experience? I hate to bring out old wounds. Oh no, it's it's all right. I've dealt with all my trauma. I think. Uh, and my, here we go. <laughs> Back down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I was. Uh, I was a co-founder of that company that that held Google's first servers. I was actually a co-founder of a, a sub part of the company to be technically accurate, the, the consulting arm of the company. And the stock that I got is a you know, relatively small amount of stock. The company split three times on the NASDAQ in one year. It became worth $36 billion. And I was the only person under 30 and the only non-vice president allowed to sit in on board meetings because I ran technology strategy for like, mergers and acquisitions. Like if we're going to buy a company, I would figure out if the technology was worth buying or not. So it was an influential position for a young guy without a lot of experience, but with a deep technical mind. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I knew all of the stuff we were going to do strategically. So it meant that I was not allowed to sell the stock. And my life's fortune went from $80 a share to $4 a share to bankruptcy. And it was illegal for me to sell my shares. All I had to do was quit my job and sell my shares, but I didn't do it because I was convinced through the forces of greed, it'll come back. I'll make even more if I don't do that. So I, you learn a lot about the voices in your head and you learn that when you face a great loss and you learn when you fast, you learn when you experience loneliness. Anytime you think you need something that you don't actually need or more like you feel like you need it. You feel like you need all that money, you don't. We have either way. You know, you feel like if you don't have tacos for lunch, you're gonna die. You actually take two months to die. So there's a lot of that weird inner dialogue stuff. And, and a, a lot of Fast This Way is about um, fear as much as it is about hunger. And it turns out those are intimately tied up. And if you can get on top of that voice in your head, really important stuff happens. So I, I learned a lot about that. Oh my God, you know, how do I deal with grief that happens when you lose a great fortune like that? Fortunately, you know, it took me another 20 years and I'm reasonably comfortable again today, but I would live paycheck to paycheck for quite a while before I made that money and after I made that money. Mm. I'm curious because you mentioned a very interesting point here, which I think is absolutely fabulous. And I want to dissect a little bit more fear factor. And when it comes to, I guess, fasting, weight loss, diets, the whole thing, what are some strategies or even what, what were the challenges that you faced initially and how did you overcome those challenges well one thing that happens is that we've been told for a long time if you don't eat six meals a day your body will go into starvation mode and then you get fat but starvation mode look starvation has killed hundreds of millions of humans throughout human history and it's killed every animal alive so starvation mode pushes deep buttons for people. And it's just not true, <laughs> but your body still believes it because you were taught that. And then it gets a little bit deeper because 
I also know that when I was heavy, as soon as I ran out of blood sugar, I would get hangry or hypoglybitchy. And I would act like a jerk. Like I'd yell at my family. I'd yell at my coworkers. And, you know, I was just a curmudgeon. So I like that word curmudgeon. Don't use it very often. Should use it more. And I, I just realized, you know what? Okay. I'm afraid of acting like a jerk. I'm afraid of being hungry. Right. And this isn't a rational fear. This is like in my tissues. And I also realized I'm afraid of being alone. That's why I keep getting in bad relationships and staying in them way longer than makes sense. And I hired a shaman to drop me off in a cave. I'm like, what, four days, no people and no food anywhere for 10 miles in any direction. That'll probably make sure I face my own garbage. And if I lose it, well, I'm just going to have to sit with it anyway. And I mean, it, it's scary to do that. It was actually quite scary. I remember I had a, a protein bar and by the way, protein bars sucked in 2008 when I did this. <laughs> and I, I was like, you know, I'm going to just put it in my backpack just in case I need it. And like, right as I was walking out of the, the shaman's kitchen, like to go have her drop me off in this cave, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not going to do this. I left it on the table and I'm glad because I know very well I would have eaten that thing. Right. And I would have had just no control over it. So I, I maybe went a little bit more aggressive than necessary on this, but it was also about, you know, understanding some of my inner wiring. And that has led me to uh, a lot of the work that I do. My neuroscience company, 40 years Zen, is on how to turn off that big fear word. But for most of us, if you can turn off your thoughts about hunger, I found a study in Fast This Way, 15% of your thoughts every day are about what's for my next meal. That's your body worrying you're going to starve. But if you can just teach your body it's not going to starve and or give it a signal because you can do things during a fast that just turn off that hunger, you get 15% of your thoughts back. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of useful because getting your thoughts back uh, then means what are you going to do with those? And maybe you can use them to process some fear. Maybe you can use them to watch a Breaking Bad again. I, like it's your free energy. You can do anything better than just worrying about food. So I don't think about donuts and, and pizza and tacos when I'm not eating. And I know that when I eat, whether I have another meal in four hours or six hours or eight hours, it doesn't really matter. I'll be fine. And my body knows that. So the worry, the anxiety that almost all humans have it goes away. And intermittent fasting is a way to do that. And you guys, wait, I got more energy, not less. What was I telling myself? So that, that's a, a, part of the, a part of the journey for me. Mm. Um, in fact, Jay, I'd like to walk you through the algorithm for all life because it, it highlights things. Yeah. I, I didn't understand this when I wrote my big book on mitochondrial function, like how these ancient bacteria embedded in our cells, how they make energy, how you hack that to have more energy. But what all life has to do first and foremost, if you were to design something to live forever, step one, put all of your focus, like 10 times more than necessary. If something might kill you, run away from, kill or hide from it. You have to do that first, okay? And that's why fear is such a big thing. And then the second F word that all life has to do is feed because famines kill everything. It's just eat everything. It's a basic rule. And this has to be such a simple algorithm that a bacteria with no brain can follow it. So protect yourself and eat you've got two of the three things all life has to do to stay around forever. You want to guess the third F word? Fast. No. no. What's it? What is it? Fertility. Fertility. Okay. Right, there's another F word that I was thinking you were going to guess. But <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> if, if all life has to stay around on earth, you got to reproduce. So you put 10 times more energy on fear, put five times more energy on food than, it, than is required unless you're actually starving, which none of us are right now. And then you put three times more energy on reproduction, right? And you do that because if the species doesn't survive, in other words, if you don't have sex as an adult on a regular basis, you feel a sense of emptiness and anxiety because your tissues believe the species will die because you might be the last animal on earth. Mm -hmm. So you have this drive to eat, a drive to reproduce and a drive to run away from stuff that isn't even going to kill you, but your tissues think it might. And that algorithm is what drives everything you've ever done that you're ashamed of. And it's not even you. It's ancient bacteria that are your puppet masters. And the, the reason that Fast This Way is, is, I think, one of my most important books and my best book is that it's the fourth F word, is friend. And all species do this. They help each other out. They're wired to be nice to each other without even thinking about it. So bacteria form yogurt and kombucha and cactus form, I don't know, 
cactus swarms over there and the trees do forests and deer have a herd and humans make communities where some of us protect the others. Some of us are cooks, you know, like we specialize in, and we take care of our young, we take care of our old. This is not a choice. This is a, a wired into our bone marrow itself. But doing that fourth F word of friending is very hard to do if there's no love in your life, if you're hungry all the time, and if you're afraid all the time. And so fasting is one of those things that turns down fear. It turns off hunger, which frees up stupid amounts of energy that you can maybe use to get some love in your life if you don't have it. And once that's there, you're like, what's left? Being nice to people. And I want to live in that world. Mm. And also the secret is get a shaman or hire a shaman, drop you off in a cave somewhere, and you can figure all this out for yourself too. <laughs> you can indeed. There are probably less painful ways. Yes, 100%. I just thought I'd, I'd laugh at that. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank um, you. But okay, so speaking about friendship, I think it's, it's quite valuable because we are, we are meant to connect with human beings. And I think food revolves around that. And I think it's interesting how you also mentioned how we're always thinking 15% or something of our mind is always going on the next meal. Like I'm always asking my, my mum, what's, what's for dinner? <laughs> or I'm always thinking, okay, what am I going to have for lunch this day? I'm, I'm putting so much priority and worry over it. Like the amount of calories, is this going to be good for me? Is this not good for me? All these issues that sort of swarm my brain and take up a lot of mental space, which is definitely not good for you. So I'm curious, like, okay, so we've been told all this stuff for such a long period of time. Okay. You should have six meals a day. You should have this for breakfast. You shouldn't have that for lunch and dinner. So what is the truth when it comes to what should we eat, when we should eat, how long we should fast, if we should fast, and should we actually have dinner? I'm curious about that. Number one, eat foods that leave you full for at least four hours. If you get hungry two hours after you ate, you ate wrong. Okay. Now, in fast this way, there's five categories of food toxins, mostly from plants, that are designed to keep you from wanting to eat the plants. Now, if you're starving to death, you can eat the plants, you'll survive, but they aren't good for you. Every food, whatever it is, is a combination of energy. It's called calories and it's good for you. You need calories in order to make energy. It's okay to eat calories. And when someone tells you, eat a nutrient dense food, they're telling you not to eat calories because they don't like you or because they're wrong. <laughs> okay. Because nutrient density isn't okay without energy. So energy first. Second is nutrients. These are building blocks that your body needs. Right. And the third thing is anti-nutrients. Mm. So if you eat foods that are full of anti-nutrients, as soon as you're done eating, your body's like, could I have something else? Prime example. You ever eaten a kale salad and just been so full and satisfied you didn't want to eat for four hours? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, kale sucks. Yeah. It's full of oxalic acid and thallium, a, a toxic metal. It's not a health food at all. It's got good marketing behind it, but it's one of those things, if you're expecting to be able to, yeah, I'm just going to rock it this morning and have like a kale smoothie for breakfast, you're probably not going to make it through an intermittent fast because you just set yourself up for dramatic hunger. So I write about these five classes of foods. The bottom line is some people are more sensitive to some of them than others, but you gotta figure out which foods make it almost impossible to fast and don't eat those anymore. They're not compatible with your biology, just straight up. And it's not the same for everyone. There's broad rules and that's why I can put them down in a book. But if these five classes are where to look, right? And things like lectins, and I've written about those pretty extensively. And even in 2010 in the Bulletproof Diet, you know, for 10 years, I've been saying, look, some lectins are a problem. Other ones aren't a problem for most people. Lectins are these plant defense compounds found in nightshade vegetables like potatoes and tomatoes and bell peppers and hot spicy peppers. If you're one of the people who's particularly sensitive to those, you eat a little bit of cayenne pepper on your food, you're going to be really hungry after you eat that. And if you're someone else who doesn't have that, sense, that issue, you're like, hey, bring it on. I'll take all the Tabasco you can bring my way. It, there's no good or bad in there. Was it compatible with your biology? Did the amount of nutrients and energy, was it high? And the amount of anti-nutrients, was it very low? And this way, you're never going to find something that's totally free of anti-nutrients, unless it's a very purified food, you know, like a certain kind of oil where there's nothing but one ingredient. So most of the time you're going to get some, but the deal is, do I have enough biological reserve to handle this? And that can reduce the, the worry and all. But a lot of the worry is physiological. It's your body going, I actually didn't get what I needed. So there's two hormones that drive hunger and cravings. 
One of them is called ghrelin and it's the hunger hormone. The other one is called CCK, which is a fullness hormone. And it's brought to you by um, Calvin Klein. And uh, <laughs> cholecystokinin is its real name. But if you can get a little bit of ketones from you know a keto kind of diet or from fasting or from using MCT oil, which I'm well known for, for putting on the map, when you do that, it raises your ketones just a little bit or intermittent fasting every other day, three days a week will over time raise your ketones just a little bit. And if you raise them just a little bit, it turns off the hunger hormone and it turns on the satiety hormone. And then you can sit there and look at the, the muffin in the morning. Do you call them muffins in Australia? What do you call those? Yeah, muffins. Yeah, muffins. muffins. All right, cool. I never know. There's all those crisps and whatever's. Is it, hey, cool. <laughs> so you, you sit there and, and it just it loses its power because you controlled your hormones. So then you don't have the physiological hunger and cravings. And then you don't get the anxiety that comes from not meeting them. And then you're calm and, and you feel at peace. And then you can just say no to the, the food. So it's that kind of a thing. The right amount to fast, minimum effective fast, 12 hour fasts three times a week. That's not going to do very much, but it's better than nothing. And maybe you go up to 14 hour fast. And the answer is different for women and for men. And most people are going to say, wow, I got this down. Maybe they use some of the fasting hacks that, that increase those hormones or decrease those hormones that are in the book. There's three big things you can do to not feel hunger during a fast and still get the benefits. But if you do that and you're saying, okay, I don't actually, like, I, I don't know that I want to fast anymore, but I know that fasting gives me energy. So I'll just fast more because I know fasting's good. There's a name for too much fasting. It's called starvation. And there's a name for lifting too many heavy weights. It's called overtraining, right? So you can overdo fasting. There's a name for too much keto. It's called burning out your hormones and your thyroid. And like, it, it's not good. A little bit of keto, great. Constant unending keto, very bad. So it's the Goldilocks zone is going in, going out and not fasting the same way every day and every week. Oh, this week? I had breakfast three times because I was tired, but I decided on the weekend I was going to do a 24 hour fast instead. And next week I did a couple. The week after I did it every day. Mixing it up is really powerful. Doing it the same way every day is really bad for women because there are times during the month when you probably ought not to fast. There's a probably two or three day period when you're menstruating. You know what? Have some protein for breakfast. You'll feel better. It's okay. You have enough stress that day without having to add more from skipping a meal, but it's not that much stress. So what foods are sort of affecting our hormones in a negative way? All foods affect hormones in a negative and a positive way. It's just a question of the degree. Right. Right? And when we talk about hormones, it depends which hormones. The, the foods that generally help with all hormones, though, are saturated fats that are undamaged, unchemically processed, and some monounsaturated fats, and animal grass-fed animal protein is generally pretty good for you. But if you're eating way too much grass-fed animal protein, it's probably not gonna work for you, right? You're gonna need some other compounds as well. And when it comes to plants, some types of plants are relatively benign and some types of plants are actually really harsh on the body. I mentioned kale. Another one is um, eggplant, is another one of the nightshade family, which is actually <laughs> really hard to do. Why, oh, you like eggplant? I hate eggplant. <laughs> There you go. So an eggplant kale smoothie is not for you. And <laughs> there are people who do great on eggplant, but there are actually not that many of them. And when they say they do great, what they mean is I'm okay. But if you take that and you say, why don't I give you guacamole instead? They're like, uh, I think I'll trade my baba ganoush for, um, uh, for guacamole. Thank you. And then they, they like the guacamole a lot better because it's higher in fat. It's higher in monounsaturated fat and it's actually a better choice. So what you want to do is focus on good quality, undamaged fats, grass fed animals, wild caught fish, no industrial agriculture at all. And when you get industrially raised animals, they put hormones in the animals and there's antibiotics there. And the fat is actually the wrong kind of fat. It's made out of corn and soy because that's what the animal ate. And then you eat it and you get inflammation because your body tries to take those fats and tries to build little batteries, little power plants out of those fats. And like, what the hell? This is not a beanstalk. You know, this is not a corn plant and it does its best, but it makes weak batteries. And then if you eat over time, grass fed butter, coconut oil, the good fats, the body's like, I got enough of this fat. I burned some for energy, but I had enough left over to build new cells. And it takes about two years to replace half the fats in your body to give yourself an oil change. And when you do it, man, you make energy more easily. And it's so amazing because all of a sudden after two years of this, I'm going to use this bulletproof coffee or I'm going to use coffee or I'm going to use a, a prebiotic fiber. I'm going to use something that helps me not feel hunger during a fast. And you wake up one day, you're like, 
I could just have water. I could just have black coffee. I'm good. And, and you don't even think about food and you actually built a new body and it, it's, it's profound. And as someone is as wrecked as I was to be able to say today, uh, at my time, it's now 420 in the afternoon. I've been on podcasts or on TV shows because it's the day I'm launching my book uh, since 6 a.m. my time. So I'm going on right now about 10 hours of back-to-back interviews. I didn't have time to eat. Guess what I had? I've had nothing today. I did have a few cups of black coffee earlier in the day. That's it. And I'll probably have dinner. And that's going to be that. But I was able to have my brain work. Was I able to just show up all day? Because I taught my biology how to do that. And it takes a little bit of time. Most people have never tried intermittent fasting. It sounds like a terrible idea. You're going to yell at your kids. You're going to feel like crap. I promise you, read fast this way and I will teach you how to do it. And I'll teach you how to do it so you don't suffer and you're never hungry. In fact, if you go to fastthisway.com for free, I will spend two weeks teaching you a course of the book because I want everyone on earth to know how to do this because it gives you enough energy to be nice to other people. It, it actually makes it better and it doesn't cost anything in order to fast. It saves you money. The people who are going to hate me are like the big food companies trying to tell you, you know, it really satisfies or just have this little snack. No, that snack makes you hungry 20 minutes later for another little snack. You won't need a snack when you do this right. Mm. And Dave is the the father of all this stuff. So you can trust him. <laughs> it, I, I like to think I'm trustworthy. You. 200 million podcast downloads and people lost a million pounds on the Bulletproof Diet and counting. So I, 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 w- I would like to tell you, look, this is the area where I'm wrong. Uh, and whenever I find something that can be you know, directionally tightened or whatever, I'll, I always do that. And right now my track record is really good on this stuff. And there's people who are pissed off about it. And a lot of vegans are saying, how dare you? You're killing animals. I'm like, you're killing animals. I look at deaths per calories for my recommendation, my friends. I'm building soil. I run a permaculture farm where we have lamb and we have sheep and we have pigs and we have chickens. I just don't eat the chickens. They're not good for you, but their eggs are pretty good. And that kind of a thing. Look, I'm increasing soil and I know about animals. And for people to say, oh, just because they can't see all of the habitat destruction and all of the animals killed by tractors and all that stuff, plant-based diet makes humans weak. It makes children particularly weak. It reduces fertility. It destroys topsoil and it's mean to the environment and it's mean to animals. So my biggest critics have been either competitors making up stories about me, or they've been people who have an agenda that isn't even based on reducing suffering. They just think it is. Otherwise, you know what? There's hundreds of thousands of people like this stuff changed my life. And God, I'm so grateful. It's like, it's the coolest thing ever. All I know is they're not going through what I went through, which was my original goal in doing this anyway. So I thank you for saying I'm trustworthy. I, I think there's enough evidence to say that it works, <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm open to that. No, you've got to look at like all the facts and the facts have sort of been laid out for each and every one of us. If you want to do, go do the research, you can do it now. And you can find out information for yourself. It's all there. Like that's what I do. I'm very aware that yeah. there are so many diets out there, so much information out there. And I'm always curious, like I'm always questioning, okay, what is, is this right? Is this wrong? What's the facts here? What's the science behind it? I'm always questioning that. I know what works for me and I always encourage people find what works, works for you. Dave's stuff I know works for me. It might not work for you. That's still okay. Other people's diet. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's it's okay. You have to find what works for you. I'm directionally right, but some people, they're just going to love their eggplant. And if they don't get it every day, they feel like crap. And if you're one of those, you're unusual, but it's okay, right? There isn't a judgment around this. This is a, a pure desire to eat stuff that's compatible with you so that you have the full ability to do whatever you want to do. And look, if you need to eat wheat to do that, I don't believe you, but okay, you can do it. It's all right. I'm not going to judge you out loud. Uh, I have a gag <laughs> reflex. I was blessed with a gag reflex when it comes to eggplant. So <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I, I picked your kryptonite food. <laughs> you did. Um, same with baby squashes and all that sort of stuff. Like never, or Brussels sprouts as well. Anyway, and go, go far off end with that. I'm curious about, okay. So speaking about uh, focus and our energy and our levels of energy. I mean, you've been doing this for 10 hours today. That's absolutely incredible. I apologize if I'm talking. No need to apologize. I signed up for it. I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. I, I'm not, I'm not stressed. And that, that's the thing. Right. I can't imagine doing this when I wait through any hours. This would have been like the worst day ever. And I wouldn't be able to remember anything. I'd be all over the place. I'm, I'm just here. Right. And man, it's, it's strangely liberating to be able to do that. 
you're full of energy, which is absolutely great. Um, so in terms of focusing better, does fat is fat or sorry, is fat a good way when we eat it to help us focus more? Or what is sort of better carbohydrates, protein, um, or fat? Which one is is better for us to focus? Well, when we talk about fat, if you had a quarter cup of soybean oil, you're going to get a different result than a quarter cup of butter or MCT oil. And if we talk about protein, there's this plant-based protein I love. It's called sarin. It's a nerve gas that was used in the Tokyo subway attacks. It's a plant-based protein from mung beans. So plant-based proteins are out, but then there's also spider venom. So animal-based proteins. So the question of is fat good for you? It depends on the fat. Right. And the answer is pretty, it depends on the protein. And then for the carbs, did you want corn syrup? Okay. That's different than eating a sweet potato. Right. So it's so easy and convenient to plant based, animal based, fat versus carb. It's all not useful information. Or you want to go on a liquid diet? Oh, the liquid's gasoline. You're like, no, I don't want to go on a liquid diet because you didn't know what the liquid was. Right. And is it maple syrup or is it water? Like, like it, it's, but when you think about it, like, oh yeah, why did I actually think protein was protein? Because if I eat whey protein, it spikes my insulin like I ate sugar, but it's good for detox, right? So you actually end up realizing, oh, foods all have benefits and they all have downsides. And I want to craft the food that's going to make me feel amazing. So for brain function, the number one thing you can do for short-term brain function, are you ready for this? Go for it. White table sugar. What? If you want to feel great for a half hour and have a brain that actually clinically measurably works better, have a cup of coffee and just, just put a several sugar cubes in there, stir that thing up and chug it. You're going to kill it. Maybe even for an hour, right? Seriously, your brain's like, yes, look at all this glucose. I'm going to go nuts. Okay. You're going to crash. You're going to feel like crap and it's not going to be good for you over time, but carbohydrates are not bad for you. And that's the point behind that. Sugar is not good for you. So what's going to work best for, for this? You're, you want to eat something that keeps your blood sugar stable, something that provides you with ketones, either because you've been on a ketogenic diet or you had MCT oil, which your neurons love because it has more energy than glucose. Mm. And if you do this, you're eating relatively um, fibrous vegetables, some starch in the vegetables, like a sweet potato, white rice, something like that, and protein. If you're eating a high protein diet, you're eating enough protein, your body's like, oh, I got to try to burn this protein to make energy. Burning protein for energy is a backup emergency pathway that creates all sorts of free ammonia in the body and it's bad. So if you're not worried about intermittent fasting, you're not worried about trying to be in keto or something like that, you eat a diet that's 50, maybe even 60, 70% fat and lots of that saturated fat. It has all the vegetables you want because vegetables have essentially no calories that matter, right? And then you eat a moderate amount of grass-fed protein in there. And that's the diet that makes most people feel good most of the time. And that's what I eat most of the time. For lunch, if I eat lunch, which I do some days, not other days, I have protein and fat. And usually it's grass-fed. Usually it's from an animal I raise because, hey, I live in a farm and I might have some vegetables with it. It's great. And then dinner, I'm probably gonna have some carbs. It's usually white rice or something similar and not a lot, but enough, it improves sleep. I'm not in ketosis all the time and I don't fast every day, but most days I have lunch at two and dinner at five or six and then I'm done and I feel best that way. Sometimes I'm like, I woke up and I got garbage sleep last night. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit run down. I'm not going to fast today. I'm going to go have, you know, bacon and sausage for breakfast <laughs> and then I'll have lunch uh, with meat and salad and I'll have dinner with some carbs and some meat and some, uh, and some fat. And that generally works. The important thing though is I'm eating very few of these anti-nutrients, the ones I talk about in Fast This Way, and I'm eating more of the things that make you feel good. And so teaching people, hey, if you're craving stuff, look at your last meal, something in there wasn't right. And just understanding that is liberating. Understanding, go to, go to bed whenever you go to bed, but don't eat at least three and ideally four or five hours before bed. Have dinner at five or six. If you do that, one thing, You'll sleep better. And you're like, let's see, four hours. I went to bed at six, I went four hours. I slept eight hours, 12 hours. And then you just have a late breakfast and you've actually fasted for 14 hours. And it wasn't even hard because all you did was just not wake up and stuff your face right away. Just wait a couple hours. Like, it's okay. Just have some tea. You'll, you'll make it. So it's that gentle kind of mindset. And, and then realizing, oh, am I eating because I'm hungry or am I eating because I'm supposed to eat? Most of the time, if you ask yourself that in the morning, if you didn't have the wrong dinner, you wake up like, I actually don't want anything. And you, your hunger turns on around 10, 11, 12, and, and it becomes real hunger around 11. But if you're doing the fasting hacks in the book, even then it's easy. 
I think it was Wim Hof who said that he only eats, I think, one meal a day. And even then he'll like feel it. He's like, I won't eat, overeat myself. I'll, I'll be so in, in tune with my body. I'll know exactly when I want to eat, but he'll eat whatever he wants. But it's just that one, yep. one meal. So it is a very powerful practice. That meal should be between about 10 a.m. and 2 or 3 p.m. ideally, because that's when the sun is at the highest. That's when our we get a strong circadian signal from the food. But look, you don't have to be perfect about fasting. You can mix it up and, and all that. And, and eating with intuition is important as well. And that's why I'm actually doing this free class for people at fastthisway.com. I will teach you the book free because I just want, want you to know it. And it's those little things, developing awareness of hunger versus cravings. It's a big deal. 100%. Dave, I do want to be mindful of your time. Sorry, I was typing you to say that there was two minutes left right when you asked me. Okay. So it's cool. Okay. <laughs> one, one final question. Okay. So you've been able to reach the age of 100 and your friends have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic. They've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Um, I really hope it's porn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did not expect that. <laughs> he lived, he loved, he had a good time. <laughs> And he ate well on the, the, the The reason I can say this is like, what I do isn't about me. And people say, what do you want your legacy to be? I'm like, I'd like my kids to say he was a great dad. Uh, th there's no other legacy than that. Who cares if when you're dead, people know your name? It doesn't matter. That's all ego. I, I, I'm doing this because I'm building the world I want to live in. And when I'm not living it anymore, I hope other people step up and do the right thing. And that's all there is. Right? So I don't care what's in the movie when I'm 100. What I care about is that I'm going to be there. I'm going to be young. And I'm going to be dancing when I'm 100 because I'm not done yet. And I'm not going to be done when I'm 100. I'm going to live to at least 180, right? And when I do that, I'm expecting to have a lot more wisdom than I do now. And since I'll have at least as much energy as I do now, and I'll have another 50 years, 50 something years um, of wisdom built up, I'll probably be even better at giving back than I am today. And at some point I'll become a village elder, and right now we have a shortage of village elders because diabetes has taken them out because Alzheimer's. If we'd have just taught them intermittent fasting 20, 30, 40 years ago, a lot of that would be going away. So I want to build a world full of people who have enough energy to be nice to each other and help. And I want to be there and I want to party and it's going to be fun. It doesn't have to be porn, but it's kind of a cool story. <laughs> I love it, Dave. Thank you so much, man, for everything that you've, you've shared today. It's been an absolute treat. I've laughed a lot, smiled a lot. Uh, people can go buy your book, Dave Asprey or bulletproof.com. Make sure you go check it out uh, fast this way. Uh, highly recommend it. Go and get it. All in the show notes below. But Dave, thank you so much for coming on the Cerebox Podcast. Thank you, Jay.